Okay. Well, oh, we need to. Okay, <laughs> terrific. Well, welcome back from the break, as we will now look at a different strategy for transforming the United Nations. As we heard earlier, some activists in the World Federalist Movement have been, con have been concerned that not only would an attempt to revise the UN Charter under Article 109 be met, be met with stiff resistance, especially by the Permanent Five on the Security Council, but that it's actually a dangerous idea. They argue that if the Charter were revised now with the growing tide of nationalism, nativism, and authoritarianism worldwide, that the UN would likely be made even weaker than it is today as despots and multinational corporations are involved rewriting the rules to let themselves go and operate unencumbered. Whether that's a realistic concern or not, they point to Article 22 of the UN Charter as the best way forward, which simply states, and I quote, the General Assembly may establish such subsidiary organs as it deems necessary for the performance of its functions. They see this as a less risky way to bring about change from within. In other words, the General Assembly can create structures that over time can help the UN evolve into a world parliament. Andreas Bummel has been a leader in this approach. He is co-founder and director of Democracy Without Borders and the Campaign for a UN Parliamentary Assembly. From 1998 to 2018, he served on the Council of the World Federalist Movement. He's author of the book, A World Parliament, Global Governance and Democracy in the 21st Century, along with Joe Linen. And he's considered one of the world's leading experts on the subject. This year, he helped launch the International Civil Society Statement for Inclusive Global Governance, also known as the We the People's Campaign. As with all of our speakers, Andreas will present for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll take questions. Donna will continue as timekeeper, and, and I'll, I'll, I will continue to go with raising your hand rather than putting the questions in the chat window as it looks like that is manageable with this number of participants. So in a moment, I'll also put the link to Democracy Without Borders in the chat window. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Andreas Bummel. Andreas? Thank you very much, Bob, for this introduction. And first of all, Congratulations to Citizens for Global Solutions on organizing this lovely online conference. And I'm very happy to see many familiar faces of people I've been working or we've been working with. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy and appreciate to be here. And for this overall conference, you have chosen this topic, Paths to a World Federation. And what I will do, like Bob has um, indicated, I will first uh, talk a bit about the origins of this path of a UN Parliamentary Assembly. I will then um, address how thinking about that path has changed over time, which it did, as you will discover. And uh, then also I will touch on the current strategies um, that we are pursuing at Democracy Without Borders, but also um, member organizations of the World Federalist Movement and the campaign, um, the We the People's campaign that has been mentioned. So um, at the very beginning, perhaps I would like to touch on this um, question of origins. Of course, the idea of a UN Parliamentary Assembly um, is about giving citizens power at the global scale. And if you look at that more general topic, um, you will see that the origins are actually going back to the French Revolution in 1793. Um, and at that time, it wasn't philosophers in some ivory tower that brought up the subject of the word parliament, but it was actual revolutionaries in Paris and elsewhere who brought it up 
um, and who said that the French Revolution, which at that time wasn't yet nationalistic French, but cosmopolitan for a few years, um, there was um, an imbalance and it wasn't clear which way it would go. And these people, they said the French Revolution should be the starting point of an overall democratic revolution on the planet, where all um, people who would get rid of their monarchs and feudal lords would join the World Republic. Well, the history has played out differently. And for today's purpose, um, we will start a little bit closer to the contemporary world. Um, and I would suggest if we look at the UN Parliamentary Assembly proposal, the first relevant instance when it was actually brought up was in 1949 after the creation of the UN, because in San Francisco, which is very interesting, and to my knowledge, um, a parliamentary body was not discussed. Um, and that's interesting because it was discussed at the Versailles peace talks after the First World War in 1919 in the official proceedings. But that is a different historical matter. So in 1949, what happened was that Louis Sohn, who was a professor or later a professor at Harvard University, and who was actually um, in 1945 participating on behalf of the US government in the San Francisco conference, he published a paper suggesting that the UN should create a parliamentary assembly. And the model he used was the newly established Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe, it's a different body. It's not the European Union or the European community. It's a complicated story. It still exists. And the Council of Europe was a body established at the time um, that would bring together European countries in order to strengthen human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in that continent. And this treaty on the Council of Europe includes a treaty body, a main body, which is a parliamentary assembly at the time already, after, immediately after the Second World War. So what Louis Sohn said, well, if this works in Europe, why does this not work at the UN too? That was the suggestion. And at the time, that is probably the origin really of this path. The idea was that, and, and that's how the, um, um, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe actually functions. The idea was that you would have delegations of national parliamentarians coming together, um, discussing all topics on the agenda of the organization, like a shadow of the intergovernmental bodies, and exercising some sort of oversight and having some specific um, powers and functions in the body. So that was um, the, the very first instance of the UN Parliamentary Assembly. Um, um, coming up after the creation of the UN. Of course, there's been, you know, there's quite some history um, if we follow, um, you know, this um, further from 1949 um, in the decades ahead during the Cold War, but this is not quite relevant for the moment. And if you are interested in it, you can um, actually look at that history in much detail in this book that um, Bob mentioned on the World Parliament, which first part is actually dealing with all of this, um, including back to the French Revolution. <laughs> so um, I would say the next real relevant um, occurrence of this proposal was in, let's say, 1991. Um, and it is important to recognize to this day, really, that it is um, deeply connected to the geopolitical and general environment in the world. Um, which concerns, like Bob has indicated, of course, um, the process of democratization, the waves of democratization that have been happening. And after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War in um, 1989 and the years after that, there was, as many might remember here, um, depending on age, there was a window, an assumed window of opportunity for real change in the international order. You know, a peace dividend was talked about, a renovation of the UN was talked about. Later, a little bit later, the Commission on Global Governance was established with high hopes attached to it. So what happened was really that in the World Federalist Movement, the idea of the UN Parliamentary Assembly was, was born in a new manifestation. 
um, with a piece of, um, um, of study that was published by Dieter Heinrich from Canada as then policy chair of the WFM, uh, and in which he actually said, well, we, you know, as opposed to the idea, you know, this model of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, what we need to do is really to look at the UN Parliamentary Assembly as a process and not as an end in itself, as an end point. And um, that is actually really the birth of, of this idea of an evolutionary concept um, attached to this, this um, body of the UN Parliamentary Assembly. Namely, and I make it very short, it starts like, um, actually, you know, the idea starts really, and that's also already put down by Dieter Heinrich, um, it starts as a very pragmatic um, and modest body of a consultative nature, still composed of national parliamentarians um, inside the UN. Um, and Bob has already mentioned Article 22, which is the magic tool that can be used ironically uh, to establish a parliamentary assembly, ironically because um, even to make a, a simple change to the Security Council will require all this um, you know, process of charter amendment, two thirds majority, veto of the P5, et cetera, et cetera. However, creating a parliamentary assembly, which I would consider um, fundamentally more significant than little changes in the Security Council, can be done by the General Assembly. And um, there's been an argument, this is just a footnote, whether that's a simple majority or two thirds majority, is it an important question that would require two thirds majority? And I think this legal debate is really, you know, um, the bottom line is the General Assembly can do what it wants to do because it, there is no legal oversight anyway. So if the General Assembly says we do it with a simple majority, then that's it. Nothing can be done about it. That's it. So um, a simple majority of a General Assembly can establish a subsidiary body like this. And that was, um, you know, in the early 90s, um, really the hopes that that would happen because um, another um, occurrence at the time, of course, was the, you know, the strengthening third wave of democratization with regime changes in Eastern Europe and Latin America and elsewhere in the world, a high upsurge of democratization in these countries, a lot of hope and, um, you know, that the process um, of the Conference on Security in Europe has had um, some influence on this change and then the Organization for Security and uh, Collaboration in Europe was established, which includes the US, and Russia, and, and Canada, and other countries. And here, too, governments decided we want to have this process, you know, we want to attach a parliamentary assembly. So, in a, a parliamentary assembly of the North, so to, of the global North, if you like, was created. And then it was said, well, we got it here. Why don't we do this in the UN, too? Right? Um, even, you know, with Russia and, and the US, France, UK, five permanent members were already members, I mean, or supporting the idea of having a parliamentary assembly at this OSCE organization. Now, I mean, I need to, don't need to delve into that much more, but um, the 1990s were a big disappointment in terms of a peace dividend and geopolitical change, um, you know, the Iraq war happened and the new world order was quite different from what progressive world federalists would have imagined. And, and then came, of course, 9-11 and the geopolitical circumstances to this day have, have worsened. So we are now, I mean, it's actually a worsening trend for 30 years and it's still going downwards right now as we speak. Um, we are developing into a situation of a new Cold War, I would say. Um, there is militarization, militarization of space. There are no prospects for nuclear um, disarmament, really. If, if you, you know, civic space across the world is shrinking and there is, researchers would speak now of a, of a growing trend of autocratization as opposed to a trend of democratization. Um, which basically means that um, more countries um, turn, you know, um, are backsliding in democracy than are um, strengthening democracy. So this is the overall the situation. And in this situation, of course, um, the concept of UN Parliamentary Assembly is under pressure. Um, and it is, it is dramatic because um, in this, you know, 
in this process of a realization that the climate crisis is already happening, it is worsening, there are more challenges, and, and we are just now experience, everyone on the planet experience the impact of COVID-19, for instance, and it's just so dramatically obvious that um, global governance institutions are failing, and the gap between where we are and where we are going to and where we should be in order for humanity to, to manage these common goods problems and um, public policy problems is widening every day. So that is dramatic, and I think that's a real challenge for world federalism and world federalist strategy in general. Um, now, I, what I would like to point out really in this overall idea that this is a path, right? Um, and this path, um, I need to elaborate on that more. Um, the idea is really that once such a UN parliamentary assembly wa was established by a simple majority of a general assembly, um, we would create the best, you know, our own best tool and instrument in the system that would drive forward system change, which includes um, helping build the con political conditions for successful charter review. And, and the idea why this, or the expectation why this would happen is informed a little bit by the European experience where the European Parliament over decades has had an instrumental role in pushing forward European integration at crucial historical moments when the governments in, in Europe were in a deadlock and um, unable to move forward. And one example of this, it was in 1984 when um, the European Parliament, then spearheaded by Altiero Spinelli, um, proposed um, the draft of the European Constitution. That was done by the European Parliament and it was not asked by governments actually to do it. They did it because the European integration process was in a, in a deadlock because of the principle of unanimity of all decisions. So what happened then was that governments were forced um, to review the, the governance of the, the free European communities at the time, which are now the European Union. And they came to the conclusion, not at last because of the pressure of the European Parliament, that they have to introduce qualified majority voting step by step in all fields of policy. And now, of course, um, the, that's one of the arguments that is being put forward very often. Of course, the UN is not the same like the EU in many respects. You know, even in the 1980s, the European communities at the time, there was an um, overall drive um, for closer integration. That was, that is ingrained, so to speak, in, in this European process. And at the UN, this does not exist in this way. That's something that I would be told by diplomats and UN mission people all the time including from um, what we would consider progressive member states. They would say, well, okay, um, but the UN is static. Um, I mean, they would, would put it in different words, right? But that's the message. The UN is a static organization. It is not an organization that has an integrative, I mean, the drive to integrate politically countries. It is static and it is governmental and that's it, finished. And that's, of course, a difference to the European Union, which is critical in this whole argument. And another difference, which is really important, is that the European integration process from the beginning was driven exclusively by democratic countries. I mean, you know, Franco Spain was not was not part of the of the European communities until, you know, that that dictatorship was removed and Spain moved into, you know, into the direction of a democratic country. And now, of course, at the UN, we got the situation that we have quite um, a number of very, um, let's say, very, very strong autocratic countries that would not give, you know, that don't care a bit about um, really the well-being of their people and who are grave human rights offenders. 
um, and who who are you know who are not allowing civic space at all at home, right? And who do not believe in democracy at the least, and who are actually um, as we speak. Um, are trying to shut out civil society organizations from UN processes, so not, not only at home, who try to kill and um, you know, silence their opponents at home and even abroad in other countries. That's, that's what the situation is. And now the whole idea that the UN under such circumstances um, would be a political integration, would become a political integration process driven by a parliamentary assembly. That is something that many cannot imagine. Um, we just need to, you know, they cannot imagine how this can happen. Where, how can we compromise with these countries who, I mean, this is just a footnote, who would come and say, oh, we, we, we are, of course, um, you know, we are, of course, um, in favor of international democracy, right? Um, we support this and we would set up at the Human Rights Council a mandate for the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order, which in fact they did, you know, Cuba, Venezuela and so on. And, um, and this is another a footnote in the footnote. In the campaign for UN Parliamentary Assembly, it has, has happened that certain massively autocratic, repressive regimes would in some way approach us and say, come to us, come to Sirte in Libya, yes? We will pay everything and you can come together and talk about your Parliamentary Assembly at the UN. And the, this is, of course, a trap. And it is a, a, a trap that we cannot walk into. We cannot, we cannot be, um, you know, embraced by these countries. And they are doing this because of a very sad reality, because they know in this way they can embarrass the democratic countries who themselves are not a bit interested in democratizing the UN. They are not a bit interested in it. So that's why you would hear from certain countries, oh, wow, we create this mandate and they would, you know, the General Assembly was a two thirds majority since 2004 has been adopting again and again and again. And now it's being adopted each year, a resolution on the promotion of an equitable and democratic international order that includes um, the provision that such an order requires um, the full participation without any discrimination of all citizens <laughs> in international decision making. But this is a trap. It's a trap and it's a difficult trap. So my response is really to all of, of you know, to this problem that it is true that we got these autocratic countries in the UN, but why would the democratic forces in, in the world leave, you know, be satisfied with the status? Because if, you know, they would be, if they wanted to, they could command a majority in the General Assembly and do it and establish the parliamentary assembly. And I would argue in the current situation where democracy is really under pressure, from these autocratic countries, there are other reasons, of course, which are quite internal and homemade. Um, however, in this situation, a parliamentary assembly at the UN that is universally inclusive, um, where we do not need to go down that road and decide this is a democracy, this is not a democracy, this country can join, can join the assembly and this cannot, we don't do that. Um, but we allow a universal assembly to, to, to be established, which includes delegates from everywhere, including from autocratic countries. But the point is this, that we, everybody would know that a Chinese delegate is speaking um, on behalf of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. That would be obvious to everybody. Who would take that seriously? I mean, honestly. So um, the point is that really, um, looking at models for the um, distribution of seats and allocation of seats in such an assembly that are serious, we can see that still we are in a situation where a clear majority would come from so-called electoral democracies. And on top of that, there are many countries 
that are not fully electoral democracies that would be considered countries in transition. And including democratic parliamentarians from these countries in, in our expectation and opinion would strengthen democracy in these countries too. So the parliamentary assembly wouldn't only be an instrument that is dealing with democratizing the UN, which is of course the primary impetus why, you know, why this idea came up in the first place. But Andreas, it is, you have about 15 minutes left. Thank you. Yes, I will try to put them to good use. <laughs> so, um, um, so it is also it is also a tool to strengthen democracy at the level of member states. Um, so, in terms of looking at it as a path towards World Federation, I am still, even under these worsening conditions, even more so than in the past. Um, convinced that this is this is a good instrument that we can use. The problem is, of course, that it has little to zero support amongst member states. And um, actually, you know, I would imagine um, the UNPA um, being, you know, it's more like let's put it in a different way. Speaking about the the paths that this conference has addressed, you know, the regional approach. I believe it was then the charter review approach um, and, and the constitutional approach. I would, in my opinion, um, we are not speaking about separate paths here. It is more a question of sequence. In a given political environment, the question world federalists needs to ask themselves, what can we achieve now? So the question is, can we achieve now um, a charter review not only put it in motion, but that's the point. Can we put in motion a charter review process and be relatively sure that we would approve of the outcome? So it is, in my opinion, not sufficient to have 20, 30 or 40 countries support the procedure, you know, putting in motion that this review process is taking place. But the question is, do these 20, 30 or 40 countries also agree to the desired outcome of such a review? That is the key question. Do these countries as a world federalist, right? Would they um, endorse the idea that we are doing this charter review, not just for its own sake, but we are doing it because we want to set up a world, democratically elected world parliament, for instance. And then you will see, at least that is my experience, there is at this point absolutely zero support. Countries, they don't even support the idea of a consultative <laughs> assembly based on Article 22. So, I mean, think, think about the logic behind this. If they ev don't even support this baby step, they just walk away. If I come and say, let's create a, 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 a legislative body, they would say, okay, bye bye. We wouldn't even have we wouldn't even have the opportunity to talk to them about this. I mean, that's one of the achievements, certainly in the campaign for UN Parliamentary Assembly, that we are really now being taken seriously. UN missions, diplomats, they do talk to us. They cannot just, I mean, most as many do, but you know, it's, it's not so easy anymore to just brush it aside and say, well, okay, um, there, there are talks, um, which doesn't mean they are having these talks because they think they want to be part of it. Um, but there they are talks, which is much more than, than was taking place 20 years ago. And so it is a question of sequence. And in my imagination, um, Achieving a threshold of a majority vote in the General Assembly, it is very difficult, but not impossible. Now, the idea is that the UN Parliamentary Assembly would help build the ground for charter review. So um, the, the delegates would fight for charter review. They would talk with their own member states. So in my imagination, the next sequence, you know, the next step um, would be for, the, for, for instance, a constitutional committee of the UN Parliamentary Assembly could deal with this. It could deal with the question of a future UN and set in motion a legitimate and official process, um, con global constitutional process, a process of drafting a global constitution. So, and in this sequence, um, I think that those who already have a blueprint, they are a step ahead of the reality, right? 
And um, I think, I mean, it is good to have blueprints because they can inform us, they can inspire us. Maybe they have, um, they contain red flags too. Um, but um, if we want to have a global constitution eventually that is not only supported by two thirds of member states, but all member states and a majority of the global population, we have to set in motion the broadest and democratic and inclusive possible constitutional process. And I, in my imagination, see a UN parliamentary assembly in the middle of it, right? It would have the, the biggest legitimacy that you can imagine as an official UN body of parliamentarians. It could set up a constitutional committee that is dealing with this. And by the way, my close colleague, Joe Leinen, for many years was chairing the European Parliament's Constitutional Committee. So there is, you know, there's precedence for all of this. And I would imagine, you know, the next step in the sequence would really be that there is an actual charter review process that has been well prepared. There would be an actual draft coming forward that would be adopted, you know, by a, by a member intergovernmental conference. Um, and, and then we would head towards ratification. And finally, in my imagination, there should be a world referendum of all people on the planet who then can say yes or no to this constitution. And now, I mean, in the European Union, and I will come to an end in a minute, you know, there was, there was, there was a constitutional process at the beginning of the 2000s. Um, you know, there was there was also um, the conference on the future of Europe, which was broadly set up with national parliamentarians, MEPs, citizens, and so on. That set that that actually created a draft constitution, and then this constitution was passed on to member states for ref and then some they they set up referenda. You know, they because the constitution was a milestone document that would actually, you know, solidify the 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 idea of shared sovereignty in Europe. And what happened was in France and then in the Netherlands, a majority said, no, we don't want that. So that is why I'm saying this this global constitutional process needs to be so well prepared. And I don't think it is enough if, if there are civil society groups and whatever. We need official. Mm, you know, an official framework and, and allies in the system, like parliamentarians who can drive it forward over a long time frame, right? This is not done in a year or two or three. It is a long term process. So in, in all of this, I still think that the parliamentary assembly has a crucial role to play. But let me go back to what I said at the beginning, and then I, I, I really promise I will finish. Um, Having said all that, right? Of course, um, our strategy would adapt if circumstances changes. You know, if if there is, I don't know what it would be, but if if some scenario develops that, and and suddenly um, a critical number of member states say, "Wow, yes, I mean, we want a world parliament and we want a charter review." I mean, I mean, I. I of course, we wouldn't sit on the sidelines and say, no, 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 this is the sequence that we had in mind. Of course not. We would be the ones who would, who would say, well, yes, this is the leap that we need now, right? Of course. But I think as world federalists, we just need to have to deal with the world as it is, right? I think it would be quite... Mm, you know, a waste of energy if, if at this time we would really lobby for world federation when countries are not even able and willing to consider a consultative parliamentary assembly. Do I have a few minutes left? I might have lost um, track of time. Yes, you can have a few more minutes. <laughs> Very good. Because then in terms of how... Um, how this path has changed or conceptions have changed, I think there's there's perhaps one one noteworthy element, and which is that we can also now, I believe, on solid grounds, argue that there is an under international law, an established right to democracy at the UN. And this relates uh, to two international instruments that we have. Well, first of all, Article 21 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, which is the democracy article in this instrument. 
However, to, I mean, we, have, we all know, you know, the, we all know the, the, the General Assembly resolutions are non-binding, which includes the Universal Declaration. So, which is more relevant, that's um, actually um, Article 25 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which has been ratified um, orderly by, I believe now, 176 or so countries, which says, and may, may I quote, every citizen shall have the right and the opportunity to take part in the conduct of public affairs directly or through freely chosen representatives. Now, of course, this convenient has set, been set up um, and um, to, to address rights at the nation, nation state level. Nonetheless, public affairs, conduct of public affairs by now is um, taking place at the UN as well. And this is actually concern, you know, confirmed um, by UN decisions themselves. Um, the predecessor body of the Human Rights Council already in 1996 had sessions on the meaning of Article 25 of this instrument, and they put on paper more than 20 years ago that the conduct of public affairs includes deliberation, decision making, and so on at the international level, which means the UN. So, I mean, there are lots of arguments that we can use, but I, I am, I mean, I have started putting this into the equation saying, well, this is, this is not a demand or we are not begging for something. It is a right of all global citizens that the UN is democratized on this basis. And so it is not us who need to justify why we want that. It is on member states to justify why nothing is happening. And now really promise the last sentence. Um, I have mentioned the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, the, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and so on, and there are now dozens of these assemblies, right? So at, at that level, it is completely recognized and, and um, you know, that, that, these, that adding parliamentarians to a body is beneficial. It is a win-win situation for most member states and organizations. And it is really amazing and astonishing that um, at the UN, this is not accepted. And that's not only the core UN organization, but the entire UN system of 36 plus entities. None of them has a parliamentary body. And this is astonishing. I mean, I, I wonder, you know, why this is accepted. So um, that was that. Um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I know Zoom is very difficult for me too um to follow but i still think i or hope I, I don't think so but i hope that you found it useful thank you great thank you so much andreas um i had said earlier that we would switch to raised hands but i see a number of people have already begun putting their questions in the chat window so i'm just going to return to that and go down those questions so the first question andreas comes from tad Deli. he asks as you well know and as you and I have long discussed, your UNPA appeal has been endorsed by more than 1,700 individuals who actually have elected, been elected as members of national legislatures. Of those, the number of current members of the US House or Senate who have endorsed that appeal is approximately zero, according to the latest tabulations. What in the world is the problem? that this UNPA idea is so widely embraced outside of the US, but so wholly rejected or unknown inside the US. You need to unmute yourself, Andreas. Yes, I was still thinking about how to respond. <laughs> and Ted, thank you very much for this question. I mean, I, I have to admit, I didn't mention what I promised to do, um, you know, the current strategies and work that we are doing in, the, in this context of the We the People's campaign and so on. Maybe I can touch on that a bit later. Um, but Ted, I mean, this is true. Um, and it is also strategically a little bit of a problem because um, the US um, still for many um, plays a big role. And it is also interesting because, and it would be a big benefit to have a couple of members of the Congress um, because the United States is, is not a member of the Interparliamentary Union, right? So this would really make a difference. And why is this the case? I think the starting point is perhaps to, to recognize as you rightfully put in your question, 
um, that probably 99% of the members of the Congress have never given it a thought. So I think that, like, let's say, if we had some serious engagement with, with, with any of them, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them sign up. I mean, which, which is exactly um, what Ted, you are doing, right? Um, um, but probably this would have to, you know, it's a matter of statistics. Probably that would have to be done on a more broader base. Um, for instance, um, if we contact 50 members of the German parliament, five would sign up. I mean, it's so um, instead of cherry picking three that we talk to, um, for instance, in Germany, where there was a real, you know, an election just a couple of weeks ago, what we will do is at, at the broadest scale, um, we will we will contact them all and see what happens. And then later, you know, we will still, of course, cherry pick those that we think are relevant. And perhaps some approach like this um, in the US might make sense, um, but it does not make sense to contact such members who are obviously opposed, you know, and it might be easy to identify them. Great, thank you. Before I take the next question, Andreas, I'll just add to that, that, that right now, even as we speak, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Citizens for Global Solutions and Democracy Without Borders are in conversation of how to create a US strategy that we would work in partnership to do. So that, um, that, that yes, we, we are discussing that right now. Maybe not right now, but these days. So, okay, moving on to our next question. Would country, this is from Jane Shestov, would countries decide how UNPA reps would be chosen if one is formed? I can imagine national campaigns for the office that would greatly increase engagement with global issues and the UN system. Yes, um, so this is one point where the concept has um, um, developed a little bit because um, at the beginning, as I indicated, the idea was that it is exclusively national parliamentarians from the ranks of national parliaments. Um, but we have come to the to the conclusion in the campaign and overall strategy that why would we why would we um, advocate such limits? Because if a member state is um, willing and able to have direct elections, why not? So in a sense, what we are suggesting is the possibility of a hybrid assembly that is composed by national parliamentarians and directly elected parliamentarians if member states uh, choose to do that. And after an initial period of I don't know how long, um, the expectation might be put into the statutes that all member states um, um, move to direct elections. Um, but it is true that, of course, direct elections would be a game changer um, for the whole assembly, um, since uh, members um, would then also be able to deal with this full time. Great. Thank you, Andreas. I see one of our presenters has his hand up. I'll, I'll take one more question from the chat window and then I'll go to Shariar. I'll let him be the exception of people who raise, the, raise their hands because I have, there's, there are too many people to see everyone on one window. So I have to keep jumping back and forth. So please stay in the chat window, but I will give our other presenter an option just after this next question. So it comes from Arthur Kanegis, um, which is please tell us more about the resolution passed, a ye ye passed year after year that there should be an international order in which all people have a voice. Right, that is, that is the resolution that is put forward by Cuba and other countries each year now um, at the General Assembly. <clears throat> and it is, it is a long resolution actually, and it is, it is like copy paste. It is um, submitted each year um, almost in the same way. Um, last year um, in September, October, that's usually, no, December when it is usually adopted, they, they added language in terms of COVID. And it's, it's quite a remarkable resolution. Um, I can actually, if you give me some time later, dig up the um, reference number and put it in the chat box. You can look at for yourself. Which, um, which also um, reaffirms the Universal Declaration on Human Right, Rights and, and, and um, reaffirms the need of a democratic international order. But it is also a little bit confusing because it would also reiterate 
and um, reaffirm um, the principle of non-interference and sovereignty. So there are some inter, you know, inner um, contradictions, I would say, in the resolution. And what is most remarkable about it is really that um, the, the group of Western and other states, um, US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, they always, um, as a bloc, um, vote against it. <laughs> And um, it's it's the world upside down, really, because um, you would you would assume that this thing is coming from democratic countries and would be opposed by the autocracies, but it's the other way around. And but this we don't need to you know that's what I try to say. We don't need to fall into that trap. Of course, the whole resolution is 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 camouflage and a smokescreen. Um, the organ the 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 governments that um, have initiated this at the beginning, they are of course not serious about it, which is obvious because they would suppress uh, democratic rights in their own countries. Um, if you like, I mean, later I can try to, to quickly get that reference number. Terrific, thank you. And I'll turn to Shariar and then we'll go back to the um, chat window. Okay, well, uh, yes, thank you. Me and um, Andreas had the pleasure of uh, entertaining several secretary generals from parliamentary assemblies in what we called how to assemble parliamentary assemblies about four years ago, including ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Countries and uh, Mercosur and uh, Parliamentary Assembly for Mediterranean. And we were enlightened that there's 50, about 50 parliamentary assemblies in the world, including in my region, like the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and, and of course Council of Europe, which never went beyond Council of Europe. Uh, now that's different from European Union. The only success story we had was the uh, European Parliament. Between all these 50, only one. And that one, to, in my opinion, now is, is seeing serious setbacks because it didn't go the constitutional route and it's treaties, European treaties. Uh, UK, 20% way of the organization left. Couple of countries are like Hungary and Poland are undermining the human rights of the European uh, Union um, Convention on Human Rights. Why? In my opinion, they didn't go the constitutional route. I have a comment, sorry, and a question. So uh, this is a serious issue. That's Europe tried to bypass that constitutional uh, uh, you know, path. And I think they're, they're having some problems. And it took 70 years to get to this point. Now, the question is uh, really about the competition we have in UNPA and that's called inter-parliamentary union. They were present in our um, seminar four years ago. They have an office in Geneva and they have an official observer status at uh, General Assembly and they are widely recognized and they have thousands of parliamentarians as members. How are we going to convince countries that UNPA is better than IPU? Yes, thanks, Sharia. This is really a very, very key question. And um, first of all, at the beginning, I would like to point out that in my perception, we are really on the same page, including in the analysis that some of these international parliamentary institutions are really um, having trouble. Um, for instance, the Pan-African Parliament um, has more recently become completely dysfunctional, not only because African Union member states would withdraw funding, but also because of internal divisions um, amongst geographical groups. Um, so it is it is really key to look at the experience we have with these with these institutions. Um, but for instance, in the European Union, without um, the European Parliament um, acknowledging all the problems, um, the integration process would have never come this far because um, parliamentary assemblies um, are usually and parliaments like the EP are um, recognized as indispensable to to grant this. Um, intergovernmental process sufficient legitimacy. Uh, member state um, 
um, um, mediated legitimacy in these cases is no longer sufficient. So um, in terms of the Interparliamentary Union, those who don't know it, it's an organization that was established in 1889. It's one of the oldest that actually exists. And um, unfortunately, if you look at the, the book um, of, of myself and Jo Leinen, you will discover quickly that this Unfortunately, this problem um, of um, the interparliamentary union standing, if I may put it that way, standing in the way of not only creating UNPA, but a full-fledged world parliament uh, goes back um, to the time even before the First World War. And um, it is like this. The, the IPU um, is um, now uh, an umbrella organization of national parliaments, which does not only have observer status, but collaboration agreements with the UN and many UN institutions. And um, member states, they cherish this collaboration because in my um, interpretation, it um, is an organization um, that does not have an oversight function. At the UN, it is not a UN body. And it is also not asking difficult questions, right? It is, it is a body that is basically um, tasked to implement. It's not tasked to actually participate in negotiations or anything. They also had a big meeting at COP, but they are at the sidelines, right? And then they would, they would be given the products that a member states produce and ask um, as national parliaments to implement them. And they are fine with that. They, they are happy. They are, they are proud to be part of anything of this, you know. And um, Sharia, the big problem really is, and I have to admit it, we cannot convince them about this. It must be, it must be political force, you know. Um, I think the arguments are really on our side. It's logical, it's uh, in, theory, in legal theory and, and all, you can really um, point out wonderfully how these two bodies are complementary. But the IPU over a century has put itself into this position and they won't leave that position. So what not must happen is really powerful political forces. And then, I mean, if that is a, if we can mobilize that, I tell you, the IPU will be out of the picture within, with, within the shortest time. Because um, in reality, not, no, not much people care about what they are doing and they have, have not much impact. And I'm not saying this because I'm against the IPU, but I'm saying this because that's how the politics, I believe, would, would work out. Okay, thank you so much, Andreas. And that actually takes us to the end of our time for questions. I want to thank both of our speakers for being here today. I think it's a wonderful coincidence that, that both Shariar and Andreas were available on the day we were talking about transforming the UN. That was not set up deliberately. That was a, a, a wonderful coincidence. I, I do want to point out that we're going to go into a break. And then after the break, uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms to discuss the presentations. I want to invite, Andre invite and ask if An Andreas and Shariar, um, you could stick around a little longer with us to join those rooms and continue the questions and discussion. If not, totally understand, you've got busy lives. So um, Andreas, I saw you shaking your head. Yes, you'll be available. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I'm really happy, like 30 minutes, is that acceptable? Yeah, 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 yes. yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the plan. And Shariar, are you free or you've got to run Actually, to the... it's only 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. We get back from break, even better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 15 minutes, no problem. Okay, sure. so we'll do 15 minutes after a 10 minute break. So you're all on break now, we'll be back. Well, let's come back on the hour. Let's on the hour, on that's, the that's hour. better, okay.